a new operator for C++ to be known as implication. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just explore in the rest of this talk what implication is and isn't, how it works, where we can use uh, make use of this operator in C++, and many more things. It's always puzzled me why we don't already have implication, but then I found this quote that seems to be, that seems to hit the nail on the head. The reason programmers do not use such things is because they're never trained to know precisely what they are, how to use them, and when to use them, as well as how to design with them. And because they are never trained, they never ask for it. It turns out, once you have a language with these Boolean operators, and you know how to design with them and use them, well, then you use them. And I believe that's absolutely correct. I've been using implication for the better part of 45 years now, off and on. And the fact that we don't have it in C++ yet uh, is significant. So what is implication? Well, we all know that there are 16 so-called logical binary connectives, namely taking a pair of bools and returning a bool. But in C++, we only have two of them, conjunction and disjunction. Well, implication is the name of another one of these 16. Well, in mathematics and logic, implication is often denoted with a right pointing double arrow like that. And there's often specific nomenclature for the left and right operands. Most of the time, the left operand is known as the antecedent, although there are a couple of other terms that are in, in some uh, frequent use. And the right operand is known as the consequent. And again, there are other, uh, there's other nomenclature for those as well. So if P and Q are denoting truth values, then when you write an implication expression of the form P arrow Q, we read that as P implies Q. Now we use implication all the time in our daily speech. For example, every time we make a promise. Consider this example. If it's raining, I will carry an umbrella. Well, that's an implication. Now, having made that promise, of course, I have a choice. If it is raining, and I don't carry an umbrella, I have broken my promise. I have not kept my word. But in all other cases, I am keeping my word independently of whether it is raining or not. And that's the essence of an implication. Every implication by default is considered true unless you have a true antecedent left operand and a false consequent right operand. And this is very similar to what we find in the legal profession under the presumption innocent until proven guilty. The point being, you need evidence if you're going to call me a liar. If not, you're committing a crime. You're slandering me. So if you have evidence that I've lied, that's equivalent to saying the implication is false you have no such evidence, whether it's raining or not, then the presumption is that I'm telling the truth. I have kept my promise. So we can summarize this behavior in the form of a table, which looks approximately like that, which sets out the, the traditional four rows of the truth table, yes? Two rows to indicate what happens if it is raining, well, the answer depends on whether I'm actually keeping my promise. But if it's not raining, then it doesn't matter whether I'm carrying an umbrella. So the highlighted row is the only row where you can legitimately say that I have broken my word, not kept my promise. And those two entries just don't matter. If it's not raining, it doesn't matter whether I'm carrying an umbrella. I have not broken my promise. You have no evidence that I have broken my promise. 
Now, more formally, if I have arbitrary predicates traditionally named P and Q, I can specify the semantics with this truth table. And I believe after looking at it for just a moment, you will recognize that this table is isomorphic to the table I just showed you on the previous page. What is less obvious, but I hope you will think about it if you haven't encountered this before, an implication of the form P arrow Q has the same semantics as the expression not P or Q. Yes, I know the parentheses are technically redundant there, but not everyone is up to date on, on the relative order of precedence. So I put it in for clarity. But because it has the same semantics, we can evaluate implication in the same short circuiting way that we evaluate, say, or. Now, when I talk about an implication and people hear the words if then, programmers who are typically the ones who are not yet very experienced often confuse implication with what we typically refer to as conditional flow of control. That's because in prose, implications are expressed as if then, and some beginning programmers especially see this as resembling an if statement. But those of course are unrelated ideas. An implication is an expression. It gives us a bool. Therefore an implication is a predicate just as much as is a conjunction or a disjunction. But in contrast, the if statement is a statement which encompasses a choice of behavior depending on the value of the predicate. Okay. Let me talk for just a brief moment about some of the properties of implication because like any other operator, implication does have some axioms and identities that are potentially exploitable in code. Here is uh, a bit of a list. It's not comprehensive, and I'm not going to discuss it in great detail, but I'll leave it on the screen for a few moments to give you a chance to look it over and either refresh your memory or become acquainted with how implication works. You may find the last few rows of particular interest. P arrow Q is often known as the positive form. Not Q implies not P is therefore known as the contrapositive and they are always equivalent. Also, please note implication is typically right associative. And finally, in the bottom row, implication can be chained. Now, what about implementing implication? Well, because we want it to short circuit in its evaluation, it's essentially not possible to, for a user to implement implication in the language today. The closest that I've been able to come is through one of a possible pair of macros that look like that. And interestingly, although tempting, the second one isn't really quite right. It's close, but not quite. Why not? Well, because the ternary operator would contextually convert the first operand to type bool, but the Q there could actually have any type. So to be safe, I really should have a cast in there that converts Q to uh, a bool value. And even after I've done that, I still have all the other traditional problems that pertain to macros and their usage. As a result of all this, my conclusion is that we need implication to be a core language feature and not a library uh, feature. I have discussed this with a number of uh, compiler experts. And all of the ones with whom I have spoken have assured me that the feature would be extremely straightforward to implement in their respective compilers. I know of two implementations. I have begun one 
And I know of a second one that is forthcoming, but I'm not yet at liberty to say where it is. Now, of particular interest to us, I believe, it is my claim that implication is incredibly useful in code. So let me share with you just two examples, and I have many, many more. The, the paper has half a dozen or so, and I can find you several uh, dozens more, but let's look at two. Here's the first one. Part of the specification of unique pointer says, if D is not a reference type, then D meets the CPT 17 copy constructible requirements. Well, I would like to implement that in my code. And in fact, I have in my implementation of the standard library as an outright implication. If D is a non-reference type, then D must also be a destructible type. Notice there's no requirement if D is a reference type. But if it's not a reference type, it must be destructible. And I would like to write it with an implication. Another specification. If we look at optional, there's an equality operator as part of the type. And its, its behavior is specified like that. The result of equality, we check whether the left and right operand have values. And it's false if one does and the other one doesn't. And otherwise, if they both have values, we have to look at the held value. That's an awkward way to phrase it. And what I've discovered is that there's an implication buried in there. The result of the equality is true if and only if either both have the same value or neither has a value. And that's what this says. And as I indicated, I can find you many, many more examples. It turns out that most of them arise in the context of expressing requirements. And so I expect to find even more applications for an implication operator once we get contracts into C++. I've looked at the programming language Eiffel, which does have an implies operator spelled out with a keyword. And I discovered that that operator is very heavily used in writing pre and post conditions. I expect the same to be true in C++. So let me discuss very briefly some of the important design decisions that I have made. Uh, these all refer to the, the latest revision of my paper known as R1. R0 had some different decisions and I've been corresponding with quite a lot of people who have persuaded me that some of my early recommendations were suboptimal. So this is what I am recommending now. First, that the new operator have a low precedence, a level of its own below the precedence of operator or, and immediately above the precedence of the assignment operators and so forth. And the rationale for that is that it typically allows us to have what most people think of as a more natural interpretation of compound expressions involving ands or ors as well as implication. A second design decision is right associativity, which matches the associativity of the ternary conditional operator. Moreover, and perhaps more importantly, it's a very common convention to consider it as right associative based on type theory because it works well with what is known as the Curry-Howard Curry isomorphism which is that every function expresses an implication. So there's some, there's some fairly significant mathematics behind the decision for right associativity. And finally, as I've already mentioned, I recommend short circuit evaluation to match the behavior of the OR operator. A couple of other uh, design elements 
One is that I want the operator to be overloadable, just as we do with AND and OR. And I've already had someone describe to me a use case for such overloading. And it was fairly impressive. So I believe that's the right decision. Additionally, we should be able to use implication in the context of a fold expression, which raises an interesting question. If the expression is vacuous, what should the value be? And I'm recommending that the value should be false. And that matches what the OR operator does when folding over a vacuous OR. I've looked at the impact on the standard library if we had an implication operator. And it appears that there are no changes that are absolutely necessary. There is one change that I will recommend and that is mentioned in the paper. There is a concept known as Boolean testable. And part of that, con that concept checks that there is uh, the correct behavior for AND and OR. I believe that it should now additionally check for implication correct behavior. I have discovered that there are some, uh, I've labeled them discretionary changes. Uh, these are editorial in nature. They don't really change any of the specification behavior. Uh, they just change the form of the specification. Namely that all of the specifications that currently have the form not P or Q can immediately be rewritten without changing any semantics as P implies Q. And there are several of those. Not a huge number, but there are several. And then there is one change that I can foresee for the future, which we could do now, but it is, it's not really necessary at this stage. And that is to uh, provide a new class template named something like logical implication that adapts the implication operator in the same way that we currently have types uh, logical and and logical or that adapt uh, conjunction and disjunction. But we can do that in the future. Now, I discovered that last week, after reading my paper, Ben Dean actually wrote a blog on the subject. And let me quote a part of his conclusion here. In this paper, Dr. Brown lays out a solid argument for adding an implication operator with explanations, use cases, design trade-offs, and implementation experience. It's a well-crafted paper. It has everything we tell new contributors is desirable. It's proper to argue constructively over the details and choices here, but let's not dismiss the idea just because it's unfamiliar and we don't under yet understand a use case in our code. I have heard from one or two other people who believe that we do not need such an operator for various reasons, but I believe we do. And let me cite a few more people. Here's what Ben Dean says again, C++ is large, it contains multitudes by design. More interestingly, C++ was designed to provide a tool set for professionals. Complaining that there are too many features is like the layman looking into an upholsterer's tool chest and explaining that there couldn't possibly be a need for all those little hammers. Yarna said this almost 30 years ago. Now, that concludes the presentation that I hope to give, at least in part, uh, at the next uh, committee meeting in Kona, Hawaii. But because I'm speaking to Core C++, I want to quote from my own paper. Part of the acknowledgments. This paper's central theme was first presented publicly during the opening keynote address at Core C++ 2022. I extend special thanks to that conference's organizers for inviting that talk and to all the attendees for the enthusiastic reception. 
it was truly a never to be forgotten experience. And I remain grateful. Thank you very much, one and all. I'll be happy to take questions if there are any.